Okay, so we've had a couple of uh, talks about the, the general video technologies that exist. Um, what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes um, is the network requirements that exist between the end systems that Emma and, and Jill have shown you. So I think Jill touched on some of the things I'm going to talk about in her one of her last slides there about the requirements on the network, but it's an important thing um, to be thinking about. So a few things I'm just going to briefly give some thoughts on. First is the Janet network itself, the thing, the network that connects all the universities in the UK together and some networks beyond that. Um, how we might work with campus IT teams to achieve the optimal end-to-end -end network performance. So we've heard, I think it was 30 milliseconds you said is the pretty much the cutoff or 3,000 kilometers. Um, it's very important to, although we're focused here on the, the end systems and the performing arts, the collaborative music, it's very important that we're all working together with the IT teams and the NRNs to make sure that those network paths are as optimal as possible and there's nothing there that's adding to latency or reducing the throughput. And being aware of those things, even if you guys aren't going to be the ones that arrange that, I think being aware of what the factors are is quite important. Um, and at uh, JISC, I've been working with, to date, um, on a project called the End-to-End -End Performance Initiative that we launched last year. Uh, pretty much universally scientific groups who are trying to push very large amounts of data around the networks. So I guess probably most of you have heard of the Large Hadron Collider uh, over at CERN. They push out a lot of data to literally hundreds of sites around the world who receive and process that data for all sorts of scientific research. Um, and they're pushing data at up to typically 40 gigabits a second. So Imperial College in London have a 40 gigabit feed of that data coming in from CERN. So we're working with them on scientific computing to make the network as optimal as it can be for those type of applications. The thing I think that's great about today is this is a use case and an application that isn't science. It's, it's performing arts, it's arts, and I think from our point of view that's a really good thing um, to be doing. Um, one of the things I will mention is this idea of something called the Science DMZ, or having come from the States, it's Science DMZ perhaps I should say. Um, this is an approach that's been applied by some US scientists to help optimize the connectivity of their big data systems in their campuses. So I'll just say a little bit about that as well. And I'll give some thoughts as to how some of these things can be applied to telepresence and Lola. I'll use the words interchangeably, I hope you don't mind. Lola is a nice catchy name for this type of application, even though it's a system in itself um, as well. So, in terms of high-speed networking, what I've shown on the right there, this is a, a, a network called Géant. That's the pan-European network that connects all the national research networks like Janet together. So every country has its own national research network. In Norway, for example, they have Unionet. Uh, in the Czech Republic, they have CESnet. Uh, they're all like Janet. They're all operated for the benefit of all the universities and research organizations in the country. Typically in Janet, the backbone networks are up to 400 gigabits a second. A typical university might be connected at 10 gigabits a second. Some colleges will be rather less than that. So I think when we're talking about the LOLA requirements, you've heard that you know, a gigabit a second is usually enough, but not necessarily always. It depends on the quality of the video um, that you want to be transmitting and the way that it's encoded. Um, we need to think about in the campuses and the sites that we're at, that if we want, say, a gigabit or maybe a bit more to run some LOLA type application, campus, even if it has 10 gigabits, that's 10% of the whole campus connectivity for one application. And bearing in mind, we might also have these scientists who are trying to push lots of science data around as well. So it's, in some ways it's a zero-sum game. You've got to have enough bandwidth and capacity to be able to make these applications work. And in some way, they're kind of competing against each other. So we need to think about that and be aware of it. Um, in the Géant context, connectivity there. We, um, Janet Network, have 200 gigs of connectivity through to Géant and beyond. So at the backbone si size of the network, we're generally in a good position. But we do need to think about how the networks connect at the edges into the canvases and then into the equipment that we're using for these telepresence um, applications. So here's an, another example. You see lots of pictures of these types of things running. So this is another demonstration that was run at an event called the Terrain and Networking Conference earlier this year. Um, 
And what this showed was uh, a demonstration of two organists playing, one in Trondheim in Norway uh, and one in a, a town in, in the Czech Republic. So about 2,000 kilometers apart. So within the bounds that Jill explained, the 3,000 kilometer limit. And they played live using a 4K gateway system and the bandwidth there was, I believe, well over a gigabit a second in terms of what they were doing. But that's very high fidelity video displayed in a huge screen in a, in a, in a large event. But that showed the power of the, the networking, that all the end-to-end -end elements had been thought about, and that the national networks and the gel network were all supporting this and making it happen, um, which was absolutely fantastic. If you want to see the video, there's a link there, and, and you can go and look at it. Um, but the, the somewhat more perhaps technical and maybe to some extent tedious or boring part of it is you have to make these networks work. You have to work with IT teams to make sure that they're um, provisioned well enough. Um, from the user's point of view, your concern is how well does this work? Is it working or not? Do I have the latency below that 30 milliseconds that seems to be uh, the sort of limit that you want for collaborative music or collaborative um, performances? Um, so you'll have a subjective view of that. Uh, is it working? And the artists will say whether it's working or not. It may be a little bit more or less than 30 milliseconds. And we heard artists, when they're playing, they, c they can compensate for um, some of these effects and they sort of adjust. Um, but we can also, thankfully, get quantitative measurements on how the network's performing. So as things are happening, we can get an idea of what's happening in the network and then see from what the artists are saying whether those measurements that we have, how well they correspond to the experience um, that the artists are getting. So we can measure things like latency, uh, the one-way delay from one performer to another. Unfortunately, there we are. The reason we got this 3,000 kilometer limit is that we're bounded by the, the speed of light until someone can figure out how to break that. We can only send data over the network at a, a certain proportion of the, the speed of light. Um, so that's where this 3,000 kilometer limit comes from. And unfortunately, that kind of puts the United States out of touch because you're looking at about a 30, sorry, a 70 millisecond round trip time if you want to go to the east coast of the United States, probably about a 150 millisecond round trip time for network traffic going to the west coast of the US. So that makes it difficult to do this type of thing um, that, far, uh, that far away. Um, there are other factors as well. It's not just the one-way delay or the latency. Jitter can be a, a factor as well. If the variation in the delay is too high, that can impact um, the, the quality that you observe. You probably experience that in phone calls from time to time, for example. And also, there's the, the throughput and the loss, or the packet loss are important. What throughput are we getting on the network? Is there packet loss on the network? If the network's unreliable and some of the data is lost, can the applications cope with that? These are in important things um, to think about. But I think the key message here is trying to understand what those requirements are and trying to map them to user experiences. We don't expect musicians or performing artists to understand the technical side of those metrics, but if you do speak to your campus IT people and the networking people, then you can at least have that conversation and try and understand things and maximize it. Just out of interest here, is there anyone here that is on the sort of networking and campus IT side? I'm guessing there isn't. But, uh, oh, okay. So. <laughs> A little bit. So you're, you're the interface between the, the group here and maybe in the, the campus <laughs> IT people. That's very handy, knowing the people that know the people. Um, so as I said at the start, at GIST now we have um, a project, an end-to-end -end performance initiative that's looking at how we can optimize end-to-end -end connectivity for various types of applications. So far it's been heavily science dominated. One of the reasons for coming here is to find out more about what you're doing and to engage with you in terms of how we can map those requirements into performing arts and networking for collaborative music, those types of things. So myself and a couple of other guys are just go going around speaking to various universities about their requirements, what they're doing, and starting to share um, best practices. Um, what type of things can affect the end-to-end -end performance of the network? Um, there are various things. Unfortunately, there's no magic bullet to guarantee end-to-end -end performance is great for your applications when you're running them. Um, but there's a number of factors that tend to come into play. So one of them is the connectivity that you have as an organization to the Janet backbone. What capacity do you have on that? Is it 10 gig? Is it 1 gig? Whatever it is, there's a limit to the 
data that you can push through that connection, bearing in mind as well that it's competing with, with other traffic on the network. How is the local campus network engineered? What's, what's happening on the campus network? How is that being built to support end-to-end um, -end transfers? Are there choke points on the network? So Jill mentioned the firewall. Even if a fi campus firewall, the main campus firewall is engineered to allow the Lola traffic to go through, firewalls are generally built to inspect lots of short-lived flows, sort of web traffic, um, perhaps thousands of those, but not so good at processing and passing through higher throughput, long-lived connections. So we typically see, certainly in the science applications, firewalls having quite a limiting factor, as sometimes an order of magnitude limiting factor on throughput. So as in one example, uh, at Durham, they were trying to do three to four gig per second for one of their science applications, but the firewall was only allowing it through at 300 to 400 meg until they architected their network to route that traffic around the firewall. So it actually wasn't being firewalled. You can see the security people probably throwing their hands up at horror at that principle. But if we want to make these applications work, we have to be able to push the traffic through at the, the rates required with the latency required. And if that means doing the security in a slightly different way, perhaps with a different device that isn't the main campus firewall that's more tuned to filtering and controlling Lola traffic rather than all the web traffic and ma looking for all the web traffic and malware that the main campus firewall is doing, then that's what we need to do. And there's various things to do with tuning the end systems and the protocols they use, but a lot of that is outside of the control of the network, and that's really about how the end systems are, are configured. Um, so the good news, as I was hinting at earlier, is because of all this big science stuff that's out there, we do have a lot of experience already about pushing data around the network at high speed and with relatively low latency. So the Large Hadron Collider people, et cetera, have been doing this. And I think that's something where we can draw on that experience and look for examples of how we can map that to telepresence and Lola, particularly within the Janet community. So at GISC, we're very interested to hear who's trying to do which type of applications across the network, and if you're having problems of getting those applications to run in the way that you would like, come and speak to us and, okay, we can't necessarily help you with the end systems, or maybe Emma can, but from the networking point of view, we're very keen to speak to you and your IT people and try and help you to make that, that work. Um, one thing that's happened in the States is they've taken an approach to define how to improve their networking in their campuses to support big science applications. They've got this model called the Science DMZ. It basically boils down to four things. One is making sure the network architecture in the campuses doesn't have bottlenecks that impede the type of applications that we're talking about here. One is that they also measure the network performance persistently over time so that if incidents occur where the application that you're running doesn't appear to be running as well as it could. They've got some data that they've taken in terms of measuring how the network is performing to be able to go back and troubleshoot um, what's going wrong. Um, they also have models for tuning the end systems. Now in big science, that's about tuning the data transfer nodes, the disk systems between which the data is being copied, copied. Sorry, In the case of Lola and Telepresence, that's all about the capture systems and the playback systems and the hardware that's being used for that. So those aren't necessarily, again, within the control of the people that run the networks, but if you can make the network run as, as well as you can, then you've got every chance, if the hardware's good as well, of getting the best possible um, experience. Um, and there's a few slides there on a workshop we had recently, if you want to go and look at that, but a lot of it's around big science. Um, so in terms of the local networks, what's that about? That's about engineering the network so that the traffic paths that your applications take are paths through which there are not bottlenecks for um, high throughput or low latency applications. That's about routing the traffic around the campus network in a way that isn't impeding it. So you're not putting the traffic generally then through the main campus firewall because that's only going to add latency and reduce throughput. So you need to think about the architecture of the network to make sure that it's friendly to the type of applications we're running. So at the, the risk of throwing a network map up in front of a bunch of non-networky people, um, what we're trying to do here, I don't have a, a pointer, but that the router on the, the top of the network there is the router which connects your site to Janet, the border router. All your traffic's coming in through that. 
The big red thing on the right there is your campus firewall that's controlling most of your campus traffic. Normally in these sort of diagrams, the firewall is a circle on fire because people like showing fire for firewall. The point of the network architecture here is not to put all your telepresence traffic and your big science traffic through that firewall, but rather take it off a separate connection at the edge of your campus through a specific switch or router to those end systems. So your traffic isn't being impeded by the campus firewall or other limitations in the campus network. If you like, in American language, it's like a high speed, low latency on-ramp to the edge of your campus network. That's where you want to put um, this equipment. Uh, the second of two things I just want to try and uh, c relatively quickly go through is measuring network um, characteristics. So in the Large Hadron Collider community, who have been working on this problem for a number of years now, they evolved to use an open source tool called Perf Sonar. What that allows you to do, sort of performance sonar, what that allows you to do, if you run that system on a set of sites, that are trying to exchange data. What it will do is measure throughput, loss, latency, the path the traffic takes between all those sites, and it will record all those measurements over time. So over time, you build up a database of measurements between all the participating sites. So if you're interested in running Lola stroke tel telepresence applications between a fairly predictable set of sites who you're regularly collaborating with, if you put these measurement tools in place, then you're going to get some telemetry on the way the network itself is performing. And then you can either, A, use those measurements to improve the way the network is set up, or B, if you're running a LOLA session and you happen to see the performance is not good on a specific day, come back to this data and look at it and see if you can deduce from the data what the problem might have been for your application running. So um, here's some... Um, screenshots of what that looks like if you're looking at it. So these are examples taken from the Large Hadron Collider community, uh, the UK nodes on that. So on the left there, you have a matrix which is bandwidth testing. So on the left, you have every row is a site running a perf sonar system. And on the top there, those are the destinations that those systems are testing against. You have a mesh where everyone's running tests to every other participant. And at a glance, you can see through the green, yellow, purple system there whether or not the throughput is good, kind of okay, or bad. And by looking at that, you can then see areas that you might want to address. So here, for example, the Liverpool High Energy Physics node is getting quite poor performance. So that's something that should be investigated. And on the right there, similarly, we have latency and loss tests. So here again, you can hover over these squares and see what the latency is. On the left here, you can see Manchester, they're getting three or four gigabits a second. On the right here, the Scottish node is getting a loss of packet loss of 0.3%. So you've got that data and that helps you see how well your network is performing. Um, it's also recording it over time. So here, for example, this is showing a plot over time of the throughput that a node was getting. So it's getting a fairly consistent 900 megabits a second. So that kind of information is really useful to you if you're trying to run collaborative applications between partners on a regular basis. So I'd certainly encourage you to speak to the networking teams that you have to think about gathering that type of data to help them help you. And then the last thing there, firewalls, again, Jill did mention that, and I sort of hinted at it earlier. It is important to think about the way firewalls might impact the applications that you're running. Worst case, as Jill was mentioning, the security people at the site might go, oh no, that, that Lola application, that looks a bit dodgy. We're not going to let that through the firewall, which is obviously not good. Um, but even if you can convince them to allow that, that traffic in, um, if it is going through the main campus firewall, it can severely, potentially severely impact the, the quality that you get. I think in the Lola guide, I think it says ideally, don't firewall Lola nodes. Of course then, this is where, the, the, again, the security people, that would have a big klaxon would go off from their heads, no firewall on, on device. Um, it's all about risk management. You need to think about, well, we need to make this performance work, and we need uh, performing arts collaboration work. The two uses of the word performance there. But we also need network performance that's good enough to actually give you a good experience. Otherwise, there's no point doing it. So what's actually the risk? If we run without a firewall, 
completely, what's the worst that can happen? And if it's just that Lola node that's connected, the worst case is perhaps the Lola node might be compromised. It's a possibility. And worst case, well, you would just lose that session and rebuild the node and use it again. So it's not like student personal data is going to be compromised by that. So think about the risks involved and, and how you're going to manage the risks, balancing that against getting the performance that you need. Um, I'll skip over that. So just some closing thoughts on that. Um, I think the type of work that we've seen already being done by the big science communities, like the, the people doing the Large Hadron Collider research, there's a lot of work they've done in terms of network performance that we can take into the LOLA world. Um, certainly at JISC, we're very keen to speak to people that want to do that and to help you figure out if you're getting poor performance, how to make that better. Certainly encourage you to deploy things like Persona or to speak to your IT people to do that so that they've got an idea of how the network's performing. Couple that then with the expertise of people like Joel and Emma on the end systems, and hopefully you can get the throughput you need and the latency below that 30 milliseconds that you, you want to see. Um, and yes, security as always is important. Never forget security. So if you're interested, there's an end-to-end -end performance list you can join. There's also a group of people called EduPert, um, who it's a European community that work together to solve network performance problems. You can join um, their mailing list as well. And there's my contact details if you want them. Okay, thank you very much.